back talking the field of strength and conditioning. We're doing it. So this week we got how. So we've talked why, what, different sectors. Now we're getting into how. So I guess the question is, how do we do it? Well, I think it's worth going into your what, the team sector versus the private sector. You can break that up however you want, but generally speaking, you're working with groups or you're working in a private for-profit commercial business. Then go into the why, right? I want to help people or I want to have... I want to have a life of purpose and meaning, or I really want a lot of notoriety and recognition. I, I want to be a public speaker. I want to write books. The why is going to be somewhere in there. And a lot of that sounds a lot like your what, but the why would be your philosophy and your mission intertwined. And then we can look at now your how. So thinking about whatever it is your what, I want to work in the team sector, the private sector, you need a certain lo- a level of skill, ability, and motivation. and I should say skill, knowledge, and motivation. So if you think about skill, you got to have to have a certain amount of prerequisite ability. And if you don't have that ability, you got to earn it. You got to work for it. So public speaking or program writing, maybe you get specialized in a certain sector of strength conditioning or team sector strength conditioning, right? I do sports science. I do return to play. I do speed development. I do Olympic lifting. I do strength development. I do uh, body compositional changes. I do energy system focus, right? Maybe you focus on that in the private sector. Like I am a body transformational specialist or I am a, I work with adult males who are in their forties or fifties and have, have enough disposable income to provide to afford personal training or small private personal training. And I think the notion of, okay, you have to have a certain level of skill to be able to do that really allows yourself to look at your why and your what and just reverse engineer it, right? So like I want to work in the team sector and I need to have these level of these individual skills in order to me to enter that. And I don't think that's something that many coaches inventory. Sometimes it's pick the easiest path. Right. You know, you don't have to make this harder than it actually has to be. You're, you're not you're not going to win any brownie points because you picked the job that you really wanted to do without really looking at your why. And then just not even inventorying what your current skill level is and deciding what things you need to acquire to get net closer to that. I see this play out all the time with continuing education. You know, a lot of times coaches will start to gravitate to shiny objects and oh, this person has a level of of notoriety and or recognition and i'm just gonna go to those seminars or buy those books or do all those online courses and yeah knowledge is we'll talk about that here in a second but those represent skills that you may already have or may not need and if you already have it getting marginally better at that versus inventorying areas that are drastically weak that are limiting you getting a job that you want to work in a specific sector based off your based off your what then looking at it from the other area of man sometimes that stuff just doesn't really apply and i think that's part that's so hard for young coaches just the the acquisition of skill that's irrelevant or not necessarily pertinent to what you want to be or do that's a huge amount of money time and then wasted energy then it gets into this idea of knowledge. And again, you know, we, we read a lot of books, we read a lot of articles, we attend seminars, we, we do online courses, we'll do site visits, we'll do all sorts of things. And if it has no synergy with your what and your why, it's just spending time and wasting money. And I, I think that's part two, like you're the proverbial hamster in a wheel, right? It's not a matter if you go to a conference and then you have no ROI for that, right? For instance, I'll tell you the story of, it was 2010. I'm working in a school that adhered to CSCCA, which is the Collegiate Strength Conditioning Association. The coaches I work with there were all CSCCA and I was CSCS and which is Certified Strength Conditioning Specialist from NSCA. I just didn't want to go, you know, just like, it's not much value there for me. And I'm, I'm not saying it's not great to see some friends. I'm not saying it's not great to maybe absorb through the, conversations you have when you go out to eat or you're hanging out in a hotel room. Those are all great. And I'm not denying that, but there's a certain level of at that stage in my career, I knew I had, I knew I had knowledge. I still needed to obtain in areas that I wanted to be better, which is specifically program writing. And 
my models were based off of the people I worked with or the books that I read, the limited exposure to that, maybe doing a couple site visits. And it wasn't until I started to invest outside of that and going to other seminars, like almost breaking away from the path. And I had to pay out of my pocket. And the thought was, all right, well, if this is worth the ROI, I should be able to see that return in regards to a pay bump or a bonus. Maybe I can get reimbursed. And it did. It, it worked out that way exactly. Now, if I didn't get a bonus or a raise, then that was wasted time and money. And you could argue that there's probably no such thing as time wasted if it's time learning and growing. Absolutely. I, have, I fully agree with that sentiment. Unfortunately, we are grossly underpaid. We're behind the eight ball in terms of accruing a lot of debt from student loans, getting a master's degree, which I've talked extent, extensively about. Of If you're not going to academia, you shouldn't be wasting your time getting a master's until you absolutely know it can get you more return on your investment in terms of compensation or bonuses, or at least having it comp covered by the school you're working at or an organization you're working with. And then the other part of, okay, well, if you're not increasing your salary annually, or if you're not getting direct reimbursement for the education that you're doing, getting, I struggle with the notion of you're actually doing things for the benefit of, of your career and just checking a box and going to a seminar. And cause time is so finite and usually we're doubling up our vacation slash continue education in the same month, at least in the college or the team sector private, you have a little bit more freedom in that, which is nice. And I've been open. That's probably the best part about being in the private sector is not being limited to a, a team sector schedule. Like I can go to things that I normally could have never gone to. And it's opened me up to a whole plethora of continued education things that I've always wanted to do. But the time window that you have is so small and you're using it to get something that's not going to net you a whole lot or make more money or give you a, a little bit more job security. I struggle with you're actually doing a good job of inventorying your knowledge and looking at the inherent gaps that you've created. And the last part would be motivation. You know, sometimes it just comes down to who has the most perseverance and stamina to get to that job or that outcome. And that really ties into your why. You know, if your why is there, you'll overcome any obstacle because it's, it's, it's foundational. And I think that part where if we're looking at young strength coaches, it's better to cut your losses early because if you're in this for money or if you're in this for self-serving purposes, and again, I, I've talked about this with your what and your why, you're not trying to be a martyr. You're not trying to be a uh, an absolute servant to the greater good. You're trying to find a living that you can provide high value to someone around you, whether it's in the team sector or the private sector, based off a why of knowing what your true purpose and meaning is to help people perform at a higher level or lose weight or feel better or serve your community and then get into this. You think that's going to be easy. That's, that is probably the simplest, most easy way to understand that anything worth having, turning a hobby into a vocation is going to come with some struggle. And if your why is an ironclad, if you haven't really dialed in, this is the what that I want to do, your motivation will fluctuate and drop off and you'll quit before you get ahead. And at that point, you hope that it wasn't too late. You hope that you didn't spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on an undergrad and graduate degree. You hope that you didn't go to countless seminars and read thousands of pages of books. You hope that you didn't have a sunk cost of time, money, and energy. And, and let's, be fa let's face it, that in the team sector, you miss out on a lot of life experiences. You know, if you look at your 20s, those are going to be the window that a lot of your friends and family are going to get married. And if you're looking at your team sector career arc, that will be the time that's most monopolized by the actual commitment to strength conditioning. And the thing that you'll come across a lot is if you're struggling with the notion of sacrificing all this personal for your career, you're probably in the wrong profession. It's just the truth of the matter and your motivation to keep doing it will be there. So your big three and what and your how is going to be your ability, your knowledge and your motivation. And if you don't have a really good idea of your what, your what and your why, that motivation, that skill or that that knowledge, that, that's it's going to be wasted and not really applied in the right direction. Do you have any tips on inventorying those things like taking it? 
from as much of an objective stance as possible. It might even be like an actual objective tool, but inventorying those items to make sure, you know, is is it going to be a right fit for me or can I can I make sure I'm getting the right education? Do you got any strategies yeah. there? Yeah. So, I mean, from a skill or ability standpoint, getting someone to evaluate your sessions, I think that's pretty easy. Or getting someone to evaluate your programming. I think those parts are pretty easy and attainable. It just takes a little bit of self-discipline. It takes a little bit of, of thick skin, of the ability to take some criticism and feedback. That part is, if you're not willing to take feedback and criticism, you're probably not trying to know about your current level of skill and ability. So getting someone watching a session and giving honest and direct feedback of, you know, from the execution of a session all the way through to the programming decisions, to the coaching, to the logistics, the organizational structure. Actually, in the in in how to become a strength coach, we talk a lot about that. But also too, in in our web show, I actually have or our membership platform, I have a coach's evaluation sheet that we I use currently with all of my staff. And it, it kind of follows this objective, but also utilizing some subjective markers. Because at the end of the day, we have to have objectivity of, hey, this is our session. This is good and bad. So people have some sort of foundation to work off. But then we also have to have the subjective because we work in the service industry. All mm -hmm. of us, team sector, private sector, we, we, we work with humans. So if we have no balance between objective and it's just all objective, like, from start to finish and there's no subjective was it fun is engaging. Do you feel like this, the people agree, this is a good use of their time that they're better served there than somewhere else. You know, that part is instrumental in terms of giving you some, a, some sort of feedback on your knowledge. I mean, not on your knowledge, your ability in terms of knowledge. I mean, do you have a basic aptitude of passing a standardized nationally recognized strength conditioning performance certification? That That's, that's kind of the foundation. In most professions, that's where you stop, which I think is a is a foreign concept to a lot of administrations or organizations you work with, right? So if you pass the law degree, if you pass the bar and you get your law law degree, if you're now a lawyer, the idea is that you're not going to spend a whole lot more time studying and researching law after you become a lawyer. I'm not saying that they're not trying to keep the sword sharp, but the commitment to con ed after you pass your the bar and become a lawyer, same thing with a doctor too. It's this, it's mostly self knowledge and just being curious versus strength conditioning. It's a constant evolution and strive for improvement to the point where it becomes this productive procrastination phenomenon. And I would tell you this, it's not as easy to appraise knowledge because a lot of times knowledge acquired is not necessarily useful or practical. And what I would tell you, if I look at your, if I look at your bookshelf and it's redundance, redundancy that spills out that you're just reinforcing a belief structure or knowledge base that you already know, but it's easy, but you spend time of just continuously doubling down on something you already know, or the, if you, and I don't want to knock them because I think early on, or a lot of the concepts in there, but like a John Maxwell book of like, you pretty much just open the book, read the first sentence, and you have the entire book. And I find there's a lot of there's a lot of that in regards to acquisition of knowledge. And you downplay the significance of having more aptitude or knowledge in a specific area. I, you focus on other things that are hard to quantify, like culture or camaraderie or or enthusiasm, which to be completely frank, I think that gets into this motivation knowledge continuum. I and mean, I'm not trying to say they're inverted, but I do think there is a, there's a duality to your motivation to continuously educate yourself and learn and be uncomfortable with that learning process it has a lot of synergy with your motivation to coach and uphold a standard and push people past a certain level of discomfort. I, I think that part, because you're demonstrating your own ability to be uncomfortable and your willingness to do that extends itself to make being comfortable making other people uncomfortable because that's where stress is and that's where your adaptation lies it lies in them in that messy very very hard challenging environment of physiological stress and the same thing with psychological stress or cognitive stress there's a certain level of of look at the inventory of your books if it's all the same thing or you go to the conferences it's just 
it just absorbing the same message just from a different person or a different year or a different location? Or do you go to a seminar and you already know everything that lecturer is going to talk about, but you're like, oh, it's good because it's, it's good. I've already understand this. Or do you know everybody there? There's a lot of data points. Uh, a lot of it is not as objective as you would like. I mean, we could do a basic aptitude test like a CSCS or a CSCCA, but I think there's a whole lot more in terms of, of actual value from knowledge obtained after you pass those things. And then the final part would be motivation. And I talk about this and how to become a strength coach, but as an intern, it's July. You know, what do you look like after you come home from July 4th or come back to work from July 4th break? And if you work with football in the summer, that's when we see the, the truth, right? We, we see that, that living embodiment of how much you're willing to endure and what's your stamina to get up at 4 a.m., set up for a group at 5.30 in the morning for five days a week for the next month. And if you're sluggish, if you're showing up late, if you're constantly frustrated or you're arguing about everything or you're just disenfranchised, you know, you have a clear representation of what the next 30 to 40 years of your life is going to be like. Cut your losses. Move on. The sunk cost is not worth it. It's not like, well, I feel, don't make yourself feel guilty about it. And I'm not saying that the, the motivated are coming to work every day, bright eyed and bushy tailed and not faking it till they make it. But there's a certain dynamic at play of if you're having more bad days than good days, you're probably not in the right place or the right environment or doing the right job. Uh, in Rick Majerus is my life on a napkin. He was talking about leaving several jobs. And it just comes down to this uh, Jesuit structure of pros and cons and just write it down line in the middle. Yes, no. And if you have more no's on certain things that you want to change, you should change. Right. And I think that part is from a motivational standpoint, if you're finding more, if you're making more excuses and finding more reasons to not do something, I think you should, you're doing the wrong thing. And when we break down your, your skill or your knowledge or your motivation and looking at in each individual sector, you know, you have to have confidence to take outside opinion or outside appraisal. You have to have the bandwidth to inventorying yourself and saying, man, these books are not really that stimulating, but I'm just flying through this. You know, if I can read, so anyone who doesn't know how to speed read, it's pretty simple. You just basically take a one inch column from the middle out, right to left, left to right, go straight down and just read straight down the middle. You can get pretty much 90% retention off that. That's the secret of speed reading. It's just basically reading right down the middle. And I know this myself because when I feel really confident with a, a topic or I feel like I grasp the topic really well, I'll speed read. But then it gets into the point of what's the point if I'm just speed reading? Like, am I really trying to acquire or am I really being challenged that I'm taking time away from my family or I'm up early trying to read? That is just productive procrastination. That's not pushing me to become a better coach, a better operator, better manager, a better support structure for the people that are depending on me to make good decisions. And it gets into this next level of my jobs evolved. Anyone who moves up or ascends into a head strength conditioning coach or a business owner, their job evolves. And I think it faces the same dilemma of I'm going to just double down on what I like or what I know, or I'm going to face the facts that I need to evolve and become better in areas that I'm not competent or proficient in because I made the choice to being a head coach, a manager, an operator, a business owner. And if I don't acquire knowledge outside of strength conditioning and what you know, the, the traditional physiology or the biomechanics or the, the, the coaching psychology or the motor learning aspect, all the, the fun stuff. That's my respite. That's my spot of I can get away from the areas that I'm constantly struggling with. It charges me up. It gasses me up. And I know that probably feels crazy to say that I'm using some of these like really dense technical things in strength conditioning as a reprieve from areas that I'm not competent in. But that's my exchange. I want to be a business owner. I want to be a head coach. I want to be a leader. Those are the sacrifices you're going to have to will and make. And if I'm asking my staff or my coaches or my athletes or my clients to be uncomfortable and I'm not willing to do the same, that's a pretty good example of how just unmotivated you are and you just have an opportunity to, to maybe face that. So I would say to answer your question of, of looking at an inventory from your skill. Hey, can you evaluate my session? Can you look at my programs? Hey, in terms of knowledge, like look at my bookshelf. What am I reading a lot? Asking people, where do you think I'm the most efficient in? Hey, I really want to work in sports science. I know nothing about data. I know nothing about those things. And then the final aspect would be looking in this other direction of what is my motivation? Am I 
constantly bitching? Am I upset? Am I disenfranchised? Am I arguing? Am I trying to negotiate my way out of stuff? Am I having a lot more bad days than good days? Am I doubling down on things that I already know because it's easy, but I'm checking the box? You know, that's the part where I look at from how to inventory that. This actually uh, kind of ties nicely into my next question in specialization. You mentioned that that line between motivation and knowledge, like if you're highly motivated, you're going to be more interested in diving deep into those materials. But there, it could also be to a detriment, right? If you get overly specialized, do you have any advice on when should we find a specialization or how broad do we need to be? Because there are a lot of topics that we need to cover. Like I'm, I'm our whole performance department here. I'm sports nutrition, sports science, sports performance, all in, all in one. Mm -hmm. um, so how, how do you think coaches should navigate that? I mean, it's a hard job. I think there's a part of, if you have nothing to inspire you, to push you, to keep you moving forward to the next day, you know, find that makes, makes a challenging job a little bit harder. So having that thing that really interests you and, and just gets you excited, I would say smart people do that and they do that well. It just has to come in balance with the stuff that you're asked to do. One of the areas that I often talk about with my staff is make sure you read your job description because that's what you're evaluated on. And too often as like an administrator or a head coach, we evaluate people on things not related to their actual job description, right? So if you're a coach who works under me and you have a very clear job description of coach these groups at these times executing the program that I've laid out for you that you need to understand from the exercises, sets and reps, the exercise order, what we're trying to accomplish with those exercises, sets, reps, order, and frequency. That's all I really worry about with you. Now, outside of those parameters, if you have an interest in something, like I really want to work on nutrition, I really want to work on sports science, I really want to work on biomechanics, I really want to work on speed development, I want to work on Olympic lifting, I want to work on on developing strength, or I really like body composition. I like adding lean muscle. I like to work on endurance or at bioenergetics. Like those are all really important, really interesting things. Not all of them are going to make you rich. Not all of them are big, sexy. Hey, this is going to have a huge attraction on social media, but if it keeps you passionate. It keeps you excited. It keeps the, the wheels turning. Then I absolutely encourage you to do it. It just has to come, relatively speaking, to your primary job description. Because what often happens is people apply themselves in a lot of areas that are not related to their jobs and they miss out on doing their job. And when it comes down to a promotion or a raise or something, it, there's an element from an administrator that you're like, I don't know, they're just not that good. And then it gets into this like level of, well, busted my ass trying to learn all these things, but it wasn't what your job was. It, like I'm, a, I'm, I like to work on cars or I like to work on a boat. How is that related to making you a better strength coach? Now, in regards to the administrator's job, you have to have a clear definition of what a, that role is supposed to do. And when you decide that, Hey, that person's going to have a specialization, you have to have one, a, a keen understanding of their interests and their passions, but two, you have to push them in the direction that makes them most qualified or capable for that. And sometimes you find that, yeah, they don't have the aptitude for it. They might be passionate about it, but it's ROI. You know, I'm going to put money and time and effort into someone that is going to develop a certain niche and they don't have the aptitude for it or they don't have the confidence for it or they just don't have the bandwidth to handle doing anything outside the basic foundational tenets of the job. That's okay. Now, one of the things that I wanted to get across in how to become a strength coach was this idea of that knowledge is going to become less and less valuable with the advent of artificial intelligence and machine learning. Mm -hmm. The the knowledge that we acquire from, all right, hey, I'm, a, I'm great at breaking down force plates or I'm great at breaking down GPS units or VB, VBT and looking at all the the tonnage or the, or the intensity and volume throughout the course of a training cycle. Like that's, that's sweet. That's great. And creating KPI metrics, relatively speaking to corresponding outcome data, you know, that, that part, that's awesome. You know, that's great. And I still geek out over it and I still really enjoy it. But the truth is, is humans are biased and are loaded with agendas and we're not going to be able to detach from that. So AI is going to have to take over for us on that. 
and that puts a dent in niches or specialization. It absolutely does. Even if you are a return to play person that bomb mechanics and machine learning and looking at facial recognition software and just applying that outwards to just looking at bomb mechanics, you know, there's going to be a point where your human eye is just not really good at, at determining biomechanical flaws. Hence why we have such reduced systems that in our assessing biomechanics, it's slow, it's deliberate. It's not really, it's not really this hundred percent correspondence we want. It's an assumption. It's hopefully a, an, a, an approximation of what might happen, but that, that's a great example of just how, how much that skill is going to be less valuable, but what it, or that knowledge would be less valuable. What it does though, it opens up a platform for developing more skill and eventually some sort of message will be spit out by putting in a bunch of data points. It's your ability to get someone motivated to do that or push through or hold them to a standard. That's going to have more and more value. So in terms of, Hey, when should I specialize? When you're so good at your job that it is undeniable and we need to keep pushing you to get better in other areas. That's pretty simple, but it's also too way harder than it actually plays out to be. And a lot of times people overlook their shortcomings or their deficiencies or inadequacies in replace of something else that's just distracting or not really the priority for them, right? If you can't get up in front of a, a team of a hundred people and break down a workout, or if you can't demonstrate something, or if it's getting to the point where they're cheating reps or they're not going through the, the range of motion they should be, I don't care about what your interest is in terms of sports science or nutrition or return to play. You're not doing the basic job and having an evaluation of what your skill is or your ability in that moment that part is the foundation to, okay, like you're smoking this, you're crushing this 10 out of 10 every single time. I'm excited for you, man. Let's go, let's go really lean into a certain niche that I think you'd be bring a lot of value to. And the part two, and this is something I think is, is often missed. And we usually attach it to compensation, which is a pretty good marker, but sometimes you see people with inflated salaries off of the pretense of circumstance, not necessarily ability or knowledge or direct contribution. There's this element of how should you evaluate someone and administrators like this is a struggle. Like this is a big part to really discern and knock off. And there's objective things like reliability and direct performance that I can quantify in some way. But then there's like this more subjective thing of they're just good to be around or everyone likes them or our coaches and athletes love them here. Or they, they always have a kind of a sixth sense about making something work. They're not the first person to suggest something, but they'll tweak an original suggestion and all of a sudden it works miraculously. And you see this, right? You see this from time in time again, where I would say in that regard, the better appraisal as an administrator to a subordinate would be this idea of if I keep giving that person more and more responsibility meaning that when they started, they had this baseline level of responsibility. And then over a certain tenure of time that they start to increase that responsibility bandwidth, they are now more valuable. And that as it evolves, hopefully it's starting to get organized and responsibilities are narrowing into a niche that this person has a high aptitude for this, whether they're incredibly motivated or just have a six, a sixth sense about it, or they just, are smart and they pick things up well and they have a large bandwidth to handle a lot of things it just happens to be this is where we pushed them in that direction. You know, that's the part where we got a niche, but as a person that's going to commit to a niche one, you got to be a very, very aware that they'll limit your opportunity, especially if you don't have an opportunity in place, right? If you're a very narrow skill set, it's very hyper developed, but it's also narrow. Your entry point becomes diminished or like limited. Then the other part where we really look at it from, it could come and you're putting all your chips in the wrong basket and you're not necessarily making a inroads to long-term career viability and longevity. And I think that part is, is hard to predict, but it's also, if you're good, you're good. If you make athletic departments better, if you make athletes better, if you make gyms better, if you produce a lot of revenue, that's all that really ever really matters in the end of the day. And if you can objectively demonstrate that you found out where you did just, Maybe being curious and being open-minded, but also too letting the current take you in that direction and not fighting it. That would probably be to me would be out of strategy as opposed to selecting a niche before you get going. 
because mm-hmm. you're still going to be classified as strength conditioning coach or a performance coach or a personal trainer. It just happens a certain level of interest or niche in a certain area. You know, I ran nutrition at Georgia Tech, USC, and then I set it up at Army and I had Will Greenberg take it over. And I did return to play at USC. I did all sports science at USC. I did all competition and team accountability at USC. Did I get any more money for that? Did I double down on it? By the way, I also did all the programming. And then when I got to Army, I had a good inventory of what I was good and bad at, or what I liked and didn't like. And I had a long discussion with each one of my staff members of, hey, I think this is an area that you would demonstrate a high capacity to do on top of your basic job, but you're not going to be able to do it unless you demonstrate a fundamental capacity to do your job in the first place. And that's, that's hopefully for the staff that works with me, very clear and understandable, and they can build off of that. And that would be the part as we break down, looking toward your future in strength conditioning, it's natural to pick a, a specialization or a niche, but it's also potentially limiting and it could be premature. Yeah, that was awesome. A lot of great insight there. A lot of good things that I think will apply to other professions as well. That's, that is, was not strength and conditioning. Well, I mean, it was because we're talking strength and conditioning, but all that applies to just about anything out there. So thanks for that, Tim. This was awesome. Thanks, Corey. Appreciate you, man. All right. I'll see you.